thank you, Will. So, yeah, my name is Ron Wakari. I'm with the School of Interactive Arts and Technology and Industrial Design at Eindhoven University of Technology. Uh, with my co-authors from Simon Fraser University, Donya Ojis, Henry Lin, Sabrina Hauser. I'm going to talk today about, a, a, I guess, a design, design research philosophical inquiry. Put all that together. But the real point is we actually are coming at these sort of philosophical ideas from design researchers, so, so we're not philosophers. Um, so let me address, I guess, the biggest question, uh, the obvious one. What's a tilting ball? It's a ball that tilts. Um, so we, uh, we designed a series of ceramic balls um, that were embedded with technology. Actually, if you want to see the paper, it actually was a, a hell of a thing to design and to, and to develop and make. You can see the paper. It's in this 2016. Um, but this whole notion of putting things at the center of philosophical inquiry is something that has run throughout the history of philosophy and really emerged of late in what we might generally understand as philosophy of technology. We make reference to that in the paper. I obviously don't have time to go through this, but I do want to point out that our real concerns are within what we call, what is called post-phenomenology. Post-phenomenology being a strand of philosophical, philosophy of technology. This is how to do philosophy in two slides. Uh, so post-phenomenology, Actually, again, but I don't want to, I want to be sure that post-phenomenology is not seen to some resolved, rarefied discipline. It's actually quite a bit of debate. But the main pr protagonist would be Don Eide, which is an American philosopher, and later Peter Paul Verbeek from the Netherlands. But one key principle that post-phenomenology holds, somebody coming out of, out of phenomenology, is the idea that the world is a set of relations. And that world, understanding the relations between us and the world is mediated through technology. And that has particular consequences for how we understand technology and how we relate to it. So in some sense, you can't understand what what it is to be human without understanding what technology is. And you can't understand what technology is without understanding what it is to be human. And so they're co-constituted. The, 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 and this is really important, and I'll, and I'll return to this through the, uh, through, the, through the presentation. But the real question for post-phenomenologists is, well, how does this technological mediation happen? Well, ID introduced the idea of relations, so the relations of technological mediation. So it's important to know there's not one single way in which technology mediates. There's a series of variants. In fact, that's really the inquiry. What are all the variants in way technologies mediate? The classic one is embodied interaction. For those of you like me who wear glasses, we are not perceptually aware anymore that we wear glasses. They're seamless. They become part of our body. That's a particular technology, technology relation. Two that I'm going to focus on in, in the, our study that emerged out of our study today um, is um, one is background. So the idea of this presence of technology is not in the foreground. So if you think about a refrigerator in your apartment or your home or the heating, the center, whatever it is in this building, the central heating system. Um, a second relation I'm going to focus on is alterity, which really speaks to the idea of interaction and human computer interaction. This actually directly relates to interaction. This idea that you interact or have a dialogue with an other, which typically a quasi other, which is typically a machine or a system. Uh, okay, so w second big question, why make a tilting ball? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Well, what we wanted to do is we wanted to investigate the phenomena and the implications of the technological mediations of this kind of artifact. And we really think it's important because we want to bring some of these deeper analytical concepts to HCI that kind of are complementary, or let's us even say go beyond interaction. But I think to really show the kind of fundamental and pivotal nature that the technologies we make, uh, how they shape and, uh, and co-construct our everyday life. But also for phenomenology, to post-phenomenology, to understand this design researchers, we bring a whole level of gener generative inquiry to the task. So a tilting bowl is a counterfactual artifact. So this is a term that we use, which is the notion that you design something that runs counter to the norms of what you would normally design, but yet can exist. It has the, so a bowl has all the plausibility of something that can exist. exist. A tilting bowl may be something stretching that plausibility. But the reason you do that is to open up a space for inquiry. And so within that space is what we do. We conduct what we call material speculations, in which we design counterfactual artifacts to be, to, they may embody a proposition or a set of questions, that they can be, and we investigate those questions through the lived with and actual experience of the counterfactual artifacts. So that's what I'm going to hope to show you today. 
But particularly to this study, we asked philosophers to live with our, our, our tilting ball. And in part because we had these questions around technological mediation. We wanted people that had the competencies to really kind of engage us to help us speculate or reveal or describe the technological mediations that occur. So whilst living with them, they were also actively co-speculating with us. We told them what the study was about, what we wanted to do, and, and there, there, was, there was not much. We were, we were as much working with them as, as, as they were participants in our study. So in the end, we ran concurrent studies. We had six philosophers and five households. I should make mention that the households were quite diverse, from somewhat precarious rental situations to, owning, to say, ownership. Um, that the philosophers themselves, of course, came from different philosophical backgrounds, from the analytic to phenomenological to political. Um, and they're also at different stages in their lives, so from just having graduated to perhaps having a, a tenured position. Um, we interviewed them every four weeks. The last interview was on week 12, which was a written interview. Uh, so we had both the textual and, 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 and the oral. And we adapted the questions as we went along, responding to the, the, the answers they'd given to us. So as the study progressed, the questions became somewhat more individualized. So now for the remainder of the presentation, I just want to cover, so what were the insights of the study? I want to talk first of all about this idea of living with, but also this notion of doing philosophical work with while you're living with the tilting bowl. And against that backdrop, and this is really kind of a, like a description of what co-speculation might be like, against that backdrop, these ideas of, of, of the human technology relations emerge. And so I'll talk about those. And then I want to speak specifically to something known as relativistic views or relational ontology, which I think is really important for design research and HCI, I think, um, uh, so I'll get to that. And then talk about how the work can perhaps benefit HCI, post phenomenology, and all that stuff. Um, okay, so living, so you're living and working with tilting bowl. So of course, there's kind of like aesthetic and practical kind of attention you give to it. Where should the bowl go? Is it better in the kitchen? Is it better in the dining room, etc.? But there was a purposeful kind of atten attention that was given to it. What we came to call, actually, they started. Uh, one of the participants called it philosophical work. So for example, Desmond and William, who lived together, who also lived in a house share, decided they were going to put the tilting bowl in the communal space. So this allowed for this ongoing discussion debate around the tilting bowl. You had this kind of classic kind of, you know, this emerged also in the interview. So this kind of classic dialectical conversation, kind of interpreting the bowl, and this active interpretation that Johanna had, who kind of came to it from a hermeneutic perspective. Desmond and William decided they were going to kind of get analysis of the, the observer and the tilt. So they created a surveillance trap for the tilting bowl. So they put a, leaned a piece of paper against it, and they put a tin cup in it so that if it tilted, the paper would fall over, and they would know it tilted. Or if they weren't in the room, they would hear the tin cup, and they would know for sure that it tilted. There was another aspect of this philosophical work, because they're living with and doing this work. And so often, they have to explain, well, you know, what's this tilting bowl to family, friends, co-workers, but they actually found this kind of externalizing, communicating what was this thing and what was it like being in the study as part of that kind of investigation. So I was just wanted to kind of give you the backdrop. So that's how this idea, these kind of reflections on, this kind of active ongoing reflections while living with emerged. And for us, it was, we were really, again, as I said, wanted to understand the human technology relation. So, the first one I'm going to talk about is background relations. Just refresh your memory. It's a technology relation that's not in the foreground, but in the background. So for example, Brenda talks about, so first of all, did the tilting bowl even, even become part of the background? I think it clearly did. So Brenda talks about how it just blends away. Desmond said, well, yeah, it's just one of those things in our house that moves. You know, it was pretty normal. But at the same time, Desmond said if he left the room and then he came back and he noticed it moved, that was kind of creepy. And, there's a couple of things to that, but one of the things is that it also reveals how things move from the background to the foreground. And this is kind of captured in what Don Eide talked about is present absence. So the idea that you could have for Desmond an idea of normalcy and anxiety at the same time. Or Johanna interpreted this as a living presence of the bull. She felt that she had a mutual respect with the tilting bull. Or John saw it as an active presence of the bull and actually saw that in contrast to other things he had in his home and actually wanted to... Would, in a future home, curate more active presence things or desirable background relations into his home, so this idea of desire. So if we come back to post-phenomenological understandings of background relations, many of the examples are spoken of as utility, so like heating, for example, or safety, like a refrigerator to keep your food safe. 
But our study shows a kind of well, much more diversity than that. So for example, it may be a matter of human values. It may be a matter of desire. Or it may be even a matter of anxiety, these things that you think you don't think about. So the next relation I want to talk about is alterity relation. And to remind you, alterity relation is this idea of having this interaction or dialogue with a quasi-other, typically a system or a machine. So at first, John was talking about the kind of attention that the bull garnered. And he kind of referred to it like his phone. Yeah, it's like checking in on my phone. But then he thought, wait a minute, you know what, that's too negative. It's not really like checking in on my phone. It's kind of more like checking in on my plants or the fish tank, or it's like watering my plants. And actually, this, this now relation to this quasi-other was a matter of care. I, talked to, I showed you Desmond and William, and they set up their surveillance trap. Well, in a subsequent interview, uh, they kind of had second thoughts. So William says, just, this what he says, politically, think about that, politically. That's the way refugees are treated sometimes. The same kind of surveillance with the bull. The same suspicion, exactly. And here there's a kind of easy, kind of this notion of objectification, but these sets of concerns that kind of shift from non-human to human concerns. Now this idea of actually having an attachment, and forming an attachment to the bull came up throughout our study. So in this case, Franklin, who his father said he was quite attached to the bull. And Franklin said, eh, you wanted to throw some cautions about that. He says, tolerance is a good thing, such as when we tolerate different religions in a single society. In other cases, it's a bad thing, such as when we tolerate the perpetuation of social injustices. And to be clear, I don't think that the tolerance of the tilting bull is of the good kind or the bad kind. And I don't really believe that tolerating the tilting bull raises an ethical concern. I just wanted to challenge the claim that tolerance indifference towards the tilting bull re represents an unequivocally good attitude. And so, again, this kind of interesting slippage between the kind of the quasi-otherness of the humanness to the non-humanness. And so, but in relation to post-phenomenology, typically we're seen as a matter of interaction and dialogue. But here, I think in our study, it was a little messier than that. There are a few more contradictions to this. That the relation to the quasi-other was a matter of care. Or it was a matter of objectification in which it was somewhat confused between non-human and human objectification or the question of normalcy and tolerance around non-human things. So the last thing I wanted to bring out from our study was what I called, that was just known as a relativistic view that sort of comes from uh, commitments from post-phenomenology, this idea of a relational ontology. As I mentioned at the beginning of the study that post-phenomenology is this co-constitution of the subject object. So for us to understand the tilting ball, we have to understand the, philo the philosopher who is observing the bull or reflecting on the bull, and vice versa. There is a hybridity between them. And now, the common sense notion of that, it's kind of obvious, sure. Philosophers came, our philosophers came from different households, so they might have different interpretations. Or they have different philosophical backgrounds, and for sure they would have different interpretations. But I think it goes somewhat, the reflection goes somewhat deeper or other, or, 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 or I guess more nuanced than that. This is another quote uh, from Franklin. And if you remember, I talked about how it was an interesting issue when they had to explain to others what this tilting bowl was in their home. So he says, and I'll try to follow with me here. He says, others had a much easier time remembering the bowl's strangeness because they had never forgotten it. And when confronted by their appreciation of that strangeness, the absence of such an appreciation of my own itself appeared strange to me. He forgot it was strange. I would be struck by how strange it was that I no longer recognized the bull as strange. Of course, to recognize that an attitude is strange is not necessarily to change that attitude. And after a few flickering moments of recognizing the strangeness of the bull, it would once again seem normal. But the sense of that sense of normalcy was strange would linger. It is a form of self-doubt or self-uncertainty to find yourself a stranger to your own attitudes. So a couple, I mean, there's a couple of things to unpack here, but one of the things is that it really kind of does kind of reveal this co-shaping, the way in which the, the understanding of the tilting ball shapes his own understanding of who he is in relation to it, and vice versa. And that vice versa part is what Don Eide talked about as multi-stability. And this creates some challenges for us as design researchers, but let me just, the multi-stability of the ball, is it a strange ball? Is it a not strange ball? Is it a not strange ball with lingering notions of being strange? And this, the idea that they, have, that they can actually have all of these stabilities, that we're actually challenged when we do this kind of design research. The thing that we design has multiple stabilities to it. 
So to kind of end, I just want to talk about how I hope this sort of work kind of shows that there's some things either within our study or in post-phenomenology that bring some concepts that are perhaps are interesting to HCI. It's a deeper set of analytical concepts that can kind of help us kind of at least be complementary or maybe unpack some ideas of interaction. Um, these are technological mediation, human technology relations, relational ontology, multi-stability. I should also pause here to say that there are a lot of others in, in our field and here in this room who have worked with post-phenomenology and we cite them in the paper and there's some great work, so this is not us alone doing this, whatever it is. Um, and then to talk about how, post, how HCI, in fact, actually can um, be a benefit to post-phenomenology. The most critical one to me is the generative inquiry, is the very design research we do. As opposed to being a retrospective analysis, we literally can design things and shape them whether in a normal sense or in our counterfactual sense, whatever any other of those two things mean, in order to do the inquiry, and that's important. We also have a whole series of innovative empirical methods that we can bring to this. Co-speculation, material speculation are just a couple. There's, there's speculative enactments, there's cultural prose, there's any number of kind of empirical methods that we can bring to this kind of philosophical work. And lastly, that the very concreteness of design research, the depth to which we do our empirical work, creates these kind of particularities that can either enrich or I hope in our case shown problematized concepts in post-phenomenology. I'm gonna end there, that's my summary slide. Um, I've already done that, so, but <laughs> if you want the points, they're there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ron. I'm, uh, Dan Lockton from Carnegie Mellon. Um, that was really, really interesting. And I, I mean, in, in lots of ways, even seeing the ideas embedded in a thing is itself, like that is itself a kind of a, a different move in a philosoph philosophical sense in some way, right? So one question I had, though, is how do you think it would be different if the bowl were not a special object that you'd given people specifically with that? that kind of strangeness to it already. So if you'd said, well, I don't know, we've altered something in your house. Some object in your environment may act in a different way, but you don't know what it is. How, like, if that, is that part of this as well, or could that be? Sorry, so you mean that we, that we said there's some object in your home and it does something, but we're not going to tell you yeah, what it is? Well, yeah, or, or I, I guess, I suppose, yeah, something like that. Or if, or if there were more things where the, the people's attention was less immediately on it to start off with, but they came to recognize more their relations with things that they hadn't previously paid attention to. You know, if your fridge yes. suddenly started doing something odd or, yeah. you know. I mean, I think that happens all the time. It's kind of hypothetical whether we could do this as a study. I mean, and I think the counterfactual nature of it is the very fact that it tilts is very, is important. And the very fact that there is the intellectual or conceptual understanding of that in, in, compar in comparison to the felt lived experience of that, and then, then comes back to a level of reasoning, all of that may, may seem silly to a lot of other people, is very important. So in that sense, uh, yeah, we actually, but we've had this in our study before, we've done kind of these odd kinds of things, and we've done it where we don't tell them what's going on. And it's kind of like a guessing game, but you know, that's not that interesting, actually. It's, it's, it, it's the very counterfactual nature of it, is the actuality of this thing while you're trying to reason through it or, 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 or tend to the experience of it. Yeah. That's where we see the heart of the kind of investigation. Yeah. That makes sense. Thanks. Okay. Right, thanks, Dan. Yeah. Hi, Eric Palmer, uh, Lehigh University. You've convinced me that I should run all my studies with philosophers as participants. <laughs> um, I, I wanted you to give a. I want to give you a chance to talk just briefly about uh, the materiality of the artifact and your choices surrounding it. Yeah. Okay. I guess it would have to be pretty brief, but. But I think that there's a couple of things. Well, first of all, uh, yeah, I am going to do every study with philosophers after this. I mean, it, it is, uh, anyway, you're absolutely right about that. Um, but, the, so, but the materiality, okay, a couple of things about the materiality. I think first of all is I think the idea of, there is the purpose, I mean, the fact that we made the bowl ourselves. I think someone else had talked about this, the level of attention, the purposefulness that we brought to it, I think, um, really does kind of, it, it's, it's a kind of reciprocity and it plays out with the, and, and, and it kind of gives it, a, and it goes beyond kind of credibility. It's a relationship. It's almost like that you then have that we can build on to do this study. So I think that was really important. I think, I think the fact that it has to fit, we, we were very careful about the ceramics and how we chose it. 
But we weren't overly stylistic about it. We do, we, I have to admit, I mean, we weren't think we're designers. Can we kind of start like, how would we design a bowl? What would be a cool bowl? You know, that honestly is kind of where we start. Um, and so I think that that's, uh, uh, but it was really important to us. It was very purposeful, and I almost kind of just go with that. But I do think we, we did choose materials. I mean, there is a, a lot of navigation. When you look at the ensembles of things and how things relate to things and what is in the home, that's actually really a, a really carefully coordinated, even though you may not be quite aware of it. And so we wanted to, we knew we were intervening in that sense. And materiality.